The following program is brought to you by Caltech. I would like to introduce our first faculty presenter this morning. He's a member of the Experimental Therapeutics Program of the Comprehensive Cancer Center and at the City of Hope and the Johnson Comprehensive Cancer Center at UCLA. He has written for over 375 scientific publications, two textbooks, and over 50 US patents. He's a founding editor of, of the Caltech um, and has been an associate editor of Chemistry of Materials and the AICHE. How do you pronounce that? A, just uh, spell it out, okay, A-I-C-H-E, I thought maybe it had a cute acronym, um, journal and the recipient of numerous awards, including the Coburn and Professional Progress Awards from the A-I-C-H-E and the I Patif Langmuir, Mo uh, Murphy and Gaiden Prizes from the ACS. He can correct my pronunciation on, on these if I've mangled them too badly. He is also the first engineer to win the NSF Alan T. Waterman Award. He was elected into the National Academy of Engineering in 1997, the National Academy of Sciences in 2006, and the Institute of Medicine of the National Academies in 2011. His research efforts involve material synthesis in two general areas namely zeolites and other solids that can be used for molecular recognition and catalysis, and polymers for the delivery of a broad range of therapeutics. He is the founder of Insert Therapeutics Incorporated, Calando Pharmaceuticals Incorporated, a company that created the first RNAi therapeutic to reach the clinic for treating cancer, Avidity Nanomedicines, and Inovia Biotech. No wonder you have so many patents. Um, he has been a member of the scientific advisory boards of CIMIX and Al Nilem. Additionally, our next speaker has achieved All-American status for master's track and field in the 400, 200, and 100 meter dashes. Very well-rounded. He is currently the 400 meter dash world champion for men of age 55 to 59. Ladies and gentlemen, the Warren and Catherine Schlinger Professor of Chemical Engineering, Dr. Mark Davis. Well, good morning. So if you ask too many hard questions, you can see I can run away from you really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this morning I'm gonna talk to you about our work to take, as Ray said, very fundamental work that started here at Caltech and I've actually moved this into treating patients now for a number of years. So this area that we work in involves making little particles or what people now call nanoparticles. So I'm gonna start off and tell you what these are and why they're different than other types of drugs. I wanna show you how and why they work and I'll illustrate this not only through what we did in animals here but also what's happened in patients now so that we actually can see how all of this moves from concept to animal to human. And I'm gonna use two examples. These are nanoparticles that were invented here at Caltech, and then we translated these into treating patients. And since today's um, topic is future medicine, um, I'll talk to you about some of the details about what you really have to do to translate this into uh, giving these to humans. I think you'll find it interesting. You always hear stories about what the FDA does. Well, I'll tell you some truth, not hearsay. And then I'm gonna end with a slide or two showing you that other than cancer, we're targeting other types of diseases uh, today here with uh, fundamental work on campus. So I wanna start off and talk about cancer, okay? Humans have been fighting cancer for a long time and the earliest examples uh, are these writings from Egypt, and look how far back people believed that they were describing breast cancer at the time and natural products like barks and leaves and so forth as cancer treatments. But it was really the turn of the last century that something went quietly by for all of us, which is, although you hear this in the, now in the press, that still the number one killer of Americans is heart disease, it's not. Under the age of 85, 
if, if in fact break it down, it's now cancer. You can see here. What's really great is heart disease has been declining at a very nice rate. Unfortunately, that's not the case for cancer. And of course, this is not just a US problem. It's a worldwide problem. And as the population is increasing, these numbers are going to grow. But if you notice these data, what's really amazing is that if you take the deaths due to HIV, malaria, and TB and sum them all up, they don't equal the deaths in cancer. And unfortunately, the prediction is that it's going to increase in cancer for these other diseases. Hopefully, they're going to stay constant or decline. So cancer has a major um, effect um, and a kind of major cost to society, both in the productivity loss due to death at an earlier age, but also this is a big one right now. And these are just an example here from the LA Times. Look at the difference between the early 90s in the early 2000s and what we pay for these therapies. Today, when some people go on therapy, it can cost two, three hundred thousand dollars per patient. Think about the numbers that were on the previous slide. It's, it's just not sustainable. It, we're just not going to be able to do that in the future. And so there was this article in Nature a couple of years ago that actually put a number on it and showed that it is the highest cost as far as health-related costs. You can see here's heart disease. Way down here is HIV. And it's interesting. Look at where they put road accidents. OK? So you, you get a calibration factor compared to other costs. And of course, we've all had friends, family, neighbors go on therapies. And so there is cost other than the dollars and cents and as you know, many people on these therapies have a really loss of quality of life when they're on therapy, both the ac acute loss of quality of life, and then for a number of these therapies, there's actually very long-term loss of quality of life, even if you have survival. So my point is, is, and I don't think this is anything that we don't all know, is that there's still a tremendous need to reduce the death rate. And I'm going to add this little bullet point here is, and I think we today, if we're going to try to change the way we do medicine, is let's try to do this with high quality of life. Let's not do it with therapies that are going to have all these devastating side effects. So if this is the case, we're going to have to attack cancers that are metastatic and they become drug resistant. So I'm sure you're all aware that in cancer, one of the difficult problems is that it can move from its original site to multiple sites, and this is called metastatic disease. So you have to treat multiple sites simultaneously. So this implies if you're going to do, develop a new therapy, it has to be given systemically or the, to the whole body. It just can't be a regional therapy. What you might not know is that when you start to treat a patient, these cells start to fight back. Okay? And so <coughs> One of the ways that they fight back is, is that they put proteins now on their surface. And these proteins act as chemical pumps. So when you give this drug again, it pumps it right out of the cell. And so drugs that would have been active in the first or second dose become inactive by the third, the fourth, the fifth. And so physicians are aware of this. And that's why they're very aware of how many times you can treat a patient with these. And unfortunately, this is why it's called multi-drug resistant is once this happens, not only the drug that stimulated it, but whole families of other drugs also get pumped out. So when a patient gets to this stage today, there's very little that can be done for them. So if we're going to make a new therapeutic, we're going to have to test this in humans first. And so what people believe the first concept of treating a human and doing what we would today call a clinical trial actually dates back to the mid-1700s. Okay, it's really pretty interesting that it was this gentleman who was a surgeon in the British Navy. And as they were sailing around the world, they were getting scurvy. And so he was trying to figure out a cure for scurvy where he took a number of sailors and then put them into groups and each gave them supplements to their diets and showed that it was really only the citrus that cured scurvy. So when you look at the history of how you, you basically, what we would call today, translate therapies, this is the earliest example that I can find 
and actually a paper in 1753. <laughs> so it goes back a long way. But today, we have to go through a very well prescribed procedure by the FDA here in the US, and there are other regulatory agencies for Europe and so forth. And you start off with what's called a phase one clinical trial, where you're trying to assess the safety of whatever your new entity is. These are typically on the order of 50 patients and on the order of a few million dollars. You then move into what's called phase two, where now you try to study and see if it really does the biology that you think it's going to do. These start at about 50 patients, but can run up into several hundreds in each of these trials. And these trials start to cost in the tens of millions of dollars. And then finally, you have to have at least one of these phase three trials to get approval. These are large trials that are statistically driven that can be hundreds if not thousands of patients. And so for example, we're about to move into one of these with our drugs and if we're estimating a thousand patients, this trial is gonna cost over a hundred billion dollars. So one experiment, about a hundred million dollars. So you have to go through these three to be then have it approved by the FDA. And so I'll tell you a little bit more about this process. And I'm gonna do it through illustrating two of these nanoparticles we made at Caltech. They both involve polymers. And the first one involves a small molecule drug. The second one was the first uh, to use RNA as a therapeutic. So just before we get started, I just wanna tell you where we are in this process. So with this first one, you know, we always have to come up with these cute names for things. It started off with this name, and now it's this name. So I'll use these interchangeably. This passed through the, the phase one experience, and now is very deep in the phase two experience. So here you can see there's all different types of cancers that are being studied here, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. And it's on the route to phase three. The second, which was the RNA-containing one, has just finished the phase one experience. So let's talk a little bit about what happens with solid tumors and why nanoparticles. So when tumors start to grow and they get more than the size of a millimeter, which is about the thickness of a credit card, now oxygen and, and other types of molecules needed for survival can't move that far from your blood system. So these cells throw out signals to your blood vessels saying, grow a new blood vessel to me so that I can get more nutrients, so I can continue to grow and grow and grow. And when this happens, it happens very quickly. And so if you look at a normal blood vessel in your body, it looks like this. And the cells that make that, that blood vessel fit together very nicely and only allow molecules to cross into this healthy tissue. So the things that are about a nanometer or a couple of nanometers or smaller can access this area, but things larger cannot. But look at the bizarre character of these vessels in a tumor. And the cells have not connected up completely yet, and so they actually let things come out here of very large sizes, hundreds of nanometers. So enter the concept of a nanoparticle. And so the National Cancer Institute says that a nanoparticle is a particle somewhere between one and 100 nanometers. These are composites of some type of material that can formulate this particle, like a polymer, or it can even be inorganic materials and some kind of therapeutic or imaging agent. So the first order concept in this field is actually quite simple, but actually quite hard to accomplish in a patient, which is the following. When you take a chemo drug, you get all these side effects, like your hair falls out, your fingernails come off, you, you get vomiting, all these things, because those molecules go everywhere in your body, okay? And they can affect all cells that are dividing. So the idea with a nanoparticle is, since healthy vessels can't let out entities that are in the nanoscale, that if I build a therapeutic that's too large to come out into these normal vessels, I now protect all that healthy area immediately, just because it can't go there. But because tumors have this interesting property where they have leaky vessels, now those particles can leak out into the tumor. So now you've biased where these can transport to within a patient and hopefully shut down all these terrible side effects. And I'll actually show you that that can be accomplished in the clinic. 
But the problem I'm trying to solve is a little bit more difficult than that, <laughs> is that I'm not only trying to get these particles to go into a tumor, but I'm trying to get them to move through the tissue and actually go inside of the cancer cell before it gives off the therapeutic agent. And the reasons are multi. The first is, what if this patient has those protein pumps on their surface? And if I were to release the drug in the tumor, it would never let the drug go into the cancer cells because those, those proteins would pump them out. But if I go in the cell, I go around those pumps, and now those drugs are active again. <laughs> Second, if I want to take a big molecule like RNA, it does not go into cells on its own. I have to actively take that RNA molecule into the cell. So the problem that I've been trying to attack is not only do I have to localize to the tumor, I have to make it move through the tumor and actually go into the cancer cell before it gives off my therapeutic. So I have two pieces of the puzzle that generally I have to work on. First, if I give an injection to a patient, I have to make it circulate, and there's all kinds of places that it can go wrong. Okay, it can stick in your lung. Can, if, if we do things wrong, there's, there's all kinds of problems. But if we do it right, we can get these to circulate for hours, if not days, in a patient so that it can interrogate your whole body and find where these tumors are and leak out into those tumors. Second, once it gets there, and this is a, a microscopic image of the, here are the particles, they go into cells by this process where the membrane of the cell pinches off and makes a vessel. Now, what happens in this vessel is that it pumps prot protons into this vessel. All your cells do this. It's the only place in your body other than your stomach where the pH is low, so it becomes acidic. And there's biological reasons why. So what we do is we put chemical sensors on these particles that say when the pH and it becomes acidic, okay, it tells me I'm in the cell. Now do a bunch of things to release the drug and get it out of there and be active, okay? So this is a, a system that not only does certain transport, but it also senses and does a variety of dynamic issues in the right place at the right time. So here's my original drawing when we started in 1996. And the reason I list this is not to show you that I can't draw. That's pretty obvious. <laughs> the point is, is that we thought about various principles to try to, to take this and make these happen in patients. And so, we started off with a set of design principles and we engineered this problem. And I can tell you that these design principles we started off in 96, we've now accomplished all of them in patients. And I'll show you how this, this works. So our idea was is that we want to have new therapies that give patient high quality of life. We want to treat metastatic drug resistant patients. We want to be able to do it in a doctor's office, not a research hospital. It has to be very effective. And if it has this low side effect profile, you might treat patients for a much longer time than you can with current. So it needs to be robust. And our keep, if we keep our fingers crossed, maybe we can do this for a reasonable cost. So as Ray mentioned, one of the things we do really well here at Caltech is fundamental science. So we took two approaches back in the mid-90s. One, start to learn how to engineering system where we could take it through FDA approval while simultaneously building very fundamental, well-controlled systems where we can start to understand how particles of the nanometer length scale interact with various organs in your body. Because nobody really knew what happens when you have things of this size, what happens in your, in your lungs, what happens in your kidneys, what happens, you know, we needed to know all of this information if we were gonna do this correctly. So here's our timeline, and I just want to show you. So we started in 96, and in this early time period here, this was where all the fundamental work occurred here on campus, where we built many, many different types of polymers. We worried about how the polymers interact with the therapeutics, how do they interact with cells, how do they interact in animals. Now Caltech doesn't have a medical school. We don't have a way to translate this into humans. So our approach was to always start small biotech companies, and then to have the small biotech company do the translation into humans. And so that occurred in this time frame. And then as I'll show you, we started into the clinic here. 
Now, I always show this slide to students is because I tell them, if, you know, it's really, even though the students here at Caltech are really smart, I always tell them, you know, it's really difficult to be brilliant every week, okay? <laughs> when you have a good idea, it takes time to work it out, okay? Be patient, do the fundamental work, and then when you get towards the application, you're just not gonna flame out when the first thing goes wrong. You're gonna have a fundamental understanding to be able to how to correct these issues. Because any, as you know, any real problem, you're gonna run into problems as you move towards the application and you have to be able to overcome those. So there are people who are worried about the safety of these. And so I was asked to testify in front of a Senate subcommittee about the safety of these nanoparticles. And so the aides to the senators told me, you have to explain this technology at about an eighth grade science <laughs> level, okay? So this is how I explain nanoparticles to the senators. So if you take a particle that's 100 nanometers and you increase it to the size of a soccer ball, that's the same number of orders of magnitude increase as the soccer ball to the planet Earth, okay? So these particles are very small particles so that when we inject them into the body of someone, they can circulate around. Even John Kerry got that part. <laughs> but the key issue is when we have a molecule that's less than a nanometer, if I increase from that size to 100 nanometers, that's the same increase in size from the soccer ball to the Goodyear blimp, okay? <laughs> So two major factors. One is the one I've described to you already is that now you're restricted from certain areas, which is a good thing. But also think about how many soccer balls I could put in a Goodyear blimp. I now have a, something that's large enough. I can carry a big payload and I can put a lot of chemical functionality into it. So these are really going to be very highly functional chemical systems. But through experimentation, we found that the Goodyear blimp analogy is too large. It really should be more like a hot air balloon, okay, is about the right size. So as I said, through work here at Caltech and now other people throughout the world trying to understand what happens, just let me show you very quick, quickly, because I'm an engineer, I always like to look and put bounds on things. It's very, the way I like to think is what, what are the bounds on everything I have to do? So what do I have to do? Well, it turns out, for some reason, your kidney has holes in it. And these holes are about 10 nanometers in size. So when you give a patient a small molecule drug, most of it goes right out in their urine and doesn't do any good for them at all, because it goes in and right out these 10 nanometer holes. So this tells us that there's a very hard number as far as the lower bound, the size. So we have to be above 10 nanometers to stop that. Now, if we want to go into tumors, we know that we have to be below a sub-100 nanometers if it wants to start to move through the tissue. And through experimentation, people are showing now if you want to go into cells by that mechanism of pinching off this membrane, there is an optimum size that's around 50 nanometers. So now we kind of know where we need to be. And what about when we make things small, you have to worry about the surface of them. So everything in your body is negatively charged. I don't know whether you knew that or not. So if you put something positive in your body, it's gonna stick everywhere. That's not a good thing, okay? So what you wanna do is you wanna have these as close to neutral and slightly on the negative. If you go too negative, you have these cells in your body and their job is to go around and eat up nature's nanoparticles, which are bacteria, viruses, fungi. They all have extremely negative surfaces. So if you go too negative, then these cells go and just gobble up all your therapeutic. So over the years, through a variety of different fundamental studies, we understand what now to do. So let me tell you about these two particles, that these are really multifunctional chemical systems. So we want to make these very benign and stealthy to your body. So the idea I had is to start off with this molecule, which is called a cyclodextrin, which is a, a ring of sugar. And the reason was that it was known that these molecules could do what's called formed an inclusion complex. So it can take greasy molecules or hydrophobic molecules and form an inclusion complex to help solubilize, to get a higher concentration of these very insoluble drugs to put into a human. And this product had just come in the 1990s. 
And when I looked at this and I saw that the dose of the cyclodextrin was eight grams into a patient, I thought it was a typo. Think about that. Like you have a headache and so forth, and if you take Advil or aspirin, what, what do you take? 100 milligrams, 200 milligrams? That's eight grams. <laughs> okay, so here you have a molecule that has extremely low toxicity. It's not immune stimulating and it's not degraded by human enzymes. So the idea I had was to try to use this as a molecular building block to make biocompatible polymers to make these nanoparticles. So we make a, a polymer that has a cyclodextrin and then it has some other stuff along this chain. So the way to think about it is it's like having a rope with a bunch of knots on it. So the cyclodextrins are the knot, and this is the rope. It's a very flexible, linear construct. And now we attach these drug molecules at these positions along this rope. And this chemistry is important, and I'll explain to you why. Now you see this molecule? This part of the molecule says, man, I don't like water. OK? It just, you know, those of you who know any chemistry know that that's a very hydrophobic molecule. So what happens is, when we put this construct in water, these go in inside the cup. So they hide from the water by going in the cup. Some of these go into cups on this strand. Some of these go into cups on other strands. And if you do this right, this self-assembles into particles by multiple of these cup molecule interactions. And so this is what it looks like. Here's two particles. It's the size and the surface charge that I told you we learned to do correctly from all this fundamental work. And here's a key issue. People always say, well, let's make a biodegradable system so that it goes away. Well, the FDA has the right to tell you if you have a biodegradable system is you have to define every fragment. OK? Think about that. Every, they, they don't ha you don't have to unless they tell you to, but they have the right to tell you that I need to know the toxicity and distribution, et cetera, et cetera. Every fragment of your system in a human if you make a biodegradable system. So the idea we had was we have two states, the assembled state, which will hopefully get to the cell. We will trigger the release of the drug. When the drug is released, remember, that's what holds the strands together. This particle will disassemble into an individual strand. We make the individual strand small enough that that strand now goes back out of your body through those holes in your kidney. So it goes away. But it doesn't decompose. So we only have to define two states, that state and that state for the FDA. And that worked quite well. So when we circulate, we can circulate like this is in an animal. The half-life of this is a day, so it's circulating for a long time. And we can put radioactive isotopes on these and do what's called positron emission tomography where we can monitor where these are going every second in the whole animal, and we can get a video and watch how it all distributes. And after it finally distributes, what you see is it accumulates, here's a tumor on this animal, and there is some that's still in the liver, okay? Nothing's 100% perfect. Anybody who tells you it's perfect, you know they're lying to you, okay? There's always gonna be some that's gonna go some other places. So I wanna see these particles, as I told you, move through the tumor, so what we did is use other small particles of gold here, and we put molecules on their surface that would bind only with the cyclodextrin. And so here's a, a picture of the therapeutic nanoparticle with the imaging particles on it, okay? So what we can do is we can take a biopsy either from the animal or the patient, spray these particles on it, and then go and look at um, fluorescence microscopy, so light that's coming from it. So this is from an animal. Here's a blood vessel that I've circled. And what you see is this is the fluorescence coming from the drug, and this is the fluorescence coming from that gold staining telling me that I have an intact nanoparticle. And you can see it's moving many cell links away from the vessel. So it's direct proof that you're moving out through the tumor. And then if we look even harder with transmission electron microscopes, here's one of those vessels in one cell in the tumor from a mouse that we've injected these in the tail vein of a mouse so it circulates, it's gone all the way into the tumor into an individual cell and you can see here are three nanoparticles. So direct evidence that these are staying as intact particles through the tumor inside the tumor cell. So 
When you look at real human tumors, these cells are dividing. And what we did here, this is a section from a biopsy from a melanoma patient. This stain stains cells that are dividing, okay? These other ones are not. So when you give a chemo drug, what happens is the concentration goes up in the tumor and then quickly flushes out of the body because it's going out the kidney. It only affects these cells that are dividing, not all these ones that have yet to divide. So what happens is that you, you get part of them and then you have these side effects that you have to now wait two or three weeks before you can dose the patient again so that they can recover. So here what we do is the linking chemistry between the particle and the drug we make so that when it goes into the cells, it gives the drug off for a very long time in a very uniform way so you have slow release of the therapy at the tumor cell. So these are measurements in a mouse tumor where you can, here's the drug and it goes on for about a week. So that when these cells are, when they get ready to divide, you always have drug on board to be able to catch them. So in fact, what you do is that when you look at this, here we've compared the nanoparticle to every other commercial drug for lung cancer. What you see is that we can eradicate, at least in these models, the, all of these tumors compared to the commercial drug. We can do so at less drug and less dosing. That's what you're after. Okay, less drug to the patient, okay? So with all of that, we translated this into humans, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that towards the end. We started this first trial at City of Hope in the summer of 2006. So this was the first patient. It comes in a vial like this. We put it into water, and here's the IV bag for it's infused into the patient. Looks like water, feels like water, smells like water. Nah, -uh, I didn't taste it, so I don't know what it tastes like. <laughs> okay, but you can't see 30 nanometer particles. It just looks like a bag of, of water. So if you're interested in this, this was one of the scariest things I ever did in my life. Somehow I let Caltech convince me to let public television follow us during this trial, okay? I said no, no, no for many weeks and then finally they, they convinced me to do this. So this film crew followed the first patient and followed us, my family, and the good news was the, first, the very first patient actually went for a very long time. So we, and it was all done in real time. We had no idea what was going to happen. But if you're interested in a lot of the subtleties of what, what happens when you move into the clinic and so forth, uh, I recommend that you take a look at this. It's like everything else on YouTube today. So after it played in the United States, it's, it's on YouTube. All you have to do is just Google curious cancer and it comes up. And it plays all over the world, and I can always tell where it plays because then the next morning I have a gazillion emails from that country. <laughs> so one morning I woke up to about 500 emails from China, and as I was flipping through them, you can see how Caltech alumni are everywhere. This guy finally told me what was going on. I'm a Caltech alum, I, and he said this show was on Chinese TV, and I love this. In the show you're called Dr. Mark and you speak perfect <coughs> Chinese. <laughs> So you obviously know what happened there because I don't speak any Chinese. <laughs> but if you are interested, it's about 30 minutes, so it's a little long for a YouTube video. But it, we go through a lot of the details and you actually see it's all in real time. None of it was gone back and shot over. So what happened in patients? This long circulation to be able to, to find these tumors. Here's what happened in rat and dog. In humans, it was even longer. It worked out very well. And you probably can't see it, but there's actually error bars on those circulation values. So these particles would circulate for several days in patients um, looking for these tumors. When we were able to get biopsies, like this was a triple negative breast cancer patient, we come back to Caltech and look, and we could see the particles in the drug in the tumor 14 days still after a dose. So this long, protracted, slow release of the drug that we saw as part of the mechanism in animals also occurred in humans. So did it work? So here's a CT scan of a lung. This is a metastatic pancreatic cancer patient. This is the lung. It should be all black. So every one of these spots is a tumor, okay, that's pancreatic cancer. 
We started treating this patient. He was given about two months to live at that time. Of course, the physician will never tell him that, which is good, but that's what the physicians were saying to us. You could see that we, we didn't make it completely go away. These are very hard when somebody's metastatic, but it did a pretty good job. His coughing went away, his quality of life went way up, and, and he actually went for a number of years um, on this therapy. Here's another example. This is a lung cancer patient. So again, this should be all black here. This is a huge, think about the size of your lung. This is a huge tumor here in the lung that you can see that we're shrinking this quite nicely. This person also um, went quite a long time um, on this therapy. And this was in the phase one experience. We were just getting started uh, with these patients. Now what about this trying to bring down the side effect profile? So this is results from 160 patients, okay? A trial in lung cancer for the 160 patients. These are the two commercial drugs that are variants of the molecule that we placed in the nanoparticle. They sell for about a billion dollars a year right now, and they're used in lung cancer and colorectal cancer. And here's the side effects that you're seeing. Now grade one and two, no problem. Yeah, you're a little queasy, yeah, you take an aspirin, you're okay. Where it's red, when you get to grade three, now it really affects your lifestyle. And grade four is a real problem. It's, it's a medical emergency. You know, you need to get to the hospital, you got problems. So you can see that even though these are commercial drugs, there's a lot of side effects like you've probably seen with your um, neighbors and friends and so forth. Where for the nanoparticle, you can see for the most effect, is, it's quite nice. For example, these wipe out the cells in your, your blood. So your platelets, your immune system, that's why you have to be careful with a, a cancer patient, you know, as far as getting sick and so forth, other types of infections. There's essentially nothing with this. So the one that everybody hates is vomiting, diarrhea, these kinds of things. None, okay? So what about hair loss, fingernail loss, et cetera? None. So all of those side effects, as we said, by trying to tune where these go, all eliminated. Now you might argue, okay, you're comparing to some pretty drugs that have some pretty bad side effect profiles. I agree. So let's take one that's considered one of the best drugs on the market today, which is called Gleevec. This is a drug that's used um, and was, is one of these molecularly designed drugs. Here's the side effect profile. So once again, we feel pretty good about bringing down the side effect profile compared to any other drugs that are on the market for a cancer. So where are we at now? As I told you, we're in the phase two experience. And because we can bring down the side effect profile, we can now do combinations that you couldn't do before. And so we think that this is gonna be really important. So now you can string together drug com combinations to have even a better effect on the patients. But as I told you, this is a long drawn out process. And so here are the estimates that if any of these phase two trials, you'd have to go into a phase three trials, when you could actually have an approved drug to give to the public. And you can see the timelines are long. Okay, so it does take a very long time and a lot of capital to, to bring these to market. Okay, let me tell you a little bit about the second one. I'm not gonna go into any, you know, the detail like of the first one. So the idea here is now people can do more genetic profiling of a patient. And so there are multiple pathways that lead to cancer and they're different in different patients. And the technology to be able to decide, well, is this the problem in this patient? Is this the problem in the second patient? Is getting better and better. So could we create therapies to go in and selectively only attack those genes that are causing the cancer in that particular patient? So there was a, a new discovery in biology in the 1990s called RNA interference. We've had it all along, but no one knew that this was going on in our bodies, is the fact that if you have a small piece, a two pieces called a duplex of RNA, we have proteins in our cells that will recognize this duplex, rip it apart, take one of the strands, and actually escort it to your messenger RNA, line it up because of the sequence, and selectively cut that messenger RNA. 
So it's believed that this is part of the, uh, a mechanism that we have to help us in an immune response to viruses. Okay? But what we can do is try to hijack this process by making our own duplexes to stop these messenger RNAs of the, of the genes that are causing the cancer. So this was the Nobel Prize. The, the discovery of the mechanism of this was to these two gentlemen. It was the Nobel Prize in 2006 in physiology and medicine for figuring out how this works in worms. Okay, So here's a real translation problem. How do we go from worms to humans? That, that's a pretty big translation, right? So I'm going to show you we were the first to be able to do this. Okay. So this is what the scale looks like. One of these duplexes compared to a molecule. But because these nanoparticles, again, are larger entities, I can still carry a fairly significant packet of this okay, in one of these nanoparticles. So we went through all the stuff that I showed you with the previous one. We translated this. We started treating patients in 2008 with this technology. And if you're interested, we, we put out the first results in 2010 on this, in this paper, Nature. But let me show you the cartoon. So the idea is, just like with the other particles, it goes into the cell into these vesicles, which is, here's my schematic. Now it has to come out, release this RNA that then gets picked up by this protein machine, <coughs> escorts it to the messenger RNA, cuts it. So now you have new fragments that didn't exist before. This messenger RNA should then go down in concentration. And then the protein that it would have made should go down. Okay? So when we went into patients, the first thing we did is, did those particles get to the tumors in patients? So we increased three different dose levels. And using that gold particle that gives off light, you can see like this is all the nanoparticles in this biopsy from a patient showing that they, from an infusion, they do go into the tumor. And if you look closely, like you can see nicely, here's a cell, here's the nucleus of the cell, many nanoparticles in this cell, none over here, okay? So being honest with you, it, it's not a nice uniform distribution in the tumor, it's very heterogeneous. But it's clear that these particles, when they go in, go inside of those cancer cells. The nice thing is when the surgeon took the biopsy and we had healthy tissue around it, we never saw an indication of the nanoparticles in the healthy tissue. It was only in the tumor. So just like I'm telling you, as tumors have these leaky vessels, we believe that that's why we don't see any out here, because there's no leaky vessels in the, in the healthy tissue. And so what you can see is this was the protein that we were knocking down. We were able to significantly eliminate that protein. And when we looked at the messenger RNA, which you can do quantitatively, we would also decrease that messenger RNA a lot in these tumors. You can see it brought it down to about 20, 25% of what it was. But the major key was we could actually, for the first time, see these new RNA fragments and go and sequence them and show that the RNA was cut at exactly the position that it was supposed to be cut by this mechanism. So this was the first example of showing you could do RNA interference in a living human being. So as Ray said, we want paradigm shifting technologies. So I always like to tell the students in my lab, dream and dream big, okay? I don't care if you fail, but I want you to dream big. So what, where's the goal of a technology like this? So what we've shown so far is that we can go into a patient and inhibit the production of a single gene and do that with a patient and have high quality of life, okay? So now the key is, there's a lot of other technology, like, people, like Jim Heath, if, if any of you know Jim here at Caltech and other places, working on if we take a, a pink prick of blood, we can now look for all kinds of signatures, whether they're proteins, RNAs, et cetera, out of blood on these arrays. This gives us a lot of information that if we now and go back and think about the progression of the disease, we can learn about what's happening to the disease and are we changing the progression of the disease. So the concept is you treat the patient, you check on their progress by doing this. Probably in the future, you'll do this at home and shove it in your iPhone. It'll call up your physician, tell you what's going on. The physician will then, in this scenario, we would say, OK, I've started off treating you against gene A and B. 
as the cancer tells it, mm, I don't like this, and it tries to mutate away from you, you change the therapy. So you, every dose, not only could you say exactly when you want to give the dose, but you could say which suite of genes you're going to attack on every dose, and it could be different. So not only a personalized medicine, but a time-dependent personalized medicine is possible with the technologies that you're seeing. There's nothing on this slide that in concept hasn't already been proven. The question would, could you integrate it? And the biggest question is, could you convince the FDA to allow you to do it? That's probably the hardest part right now. <laughs>